Um, this time, I'm very happy to say that we have uh, Chun Ting Zhou here to give a guest lecture on models with latent random variables. Um, I'll unmute you now, Chun Ting, so you can talk also. Um, and uh, so Chun Ting is a, an expert in this area and has done lots of uh, different work here. So she'll go over the basics, of course, but you know, feel free um, to ask any questions uh, that you would like to ask via chat. Um, I will be here the entire time listening. Um, I'll turn my video off uh, for connection reasons, and Chunting has her video off for connection reasons also. Um, but uh, yeah, other than that, uh, feel free to ask questions via chat anytime, and I'll, I'll monitor them to make sure uh, Chunting doesn't miss any. So, uh, Chunting, are, are you there and ready? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm ready. Great. So I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, I'm very happy to give this lecture on latent variable models. And feel free to ask me questions in the chat panel, and uh, I will try to answer your questions. Um, so let's get started. Uh, so before we get into the latent variable models, I want to first stress the differences between discriminative models versus the generative models. So the discriminative models calculate the probability of output y given the input x. So it, can, it computes the conditional probability of px, py given x. And the general two models calculate the probability of, uh, of the observed data x, or the multiple, or, or model the joint probability over the uh, both observed data x and the label y. Uh, so, uh, for example, the CNN classifier you have implemented in assignment one is a typical discriminative model, and the generative adversarial network you just learned in the last lecture is a generative model. Um, and the other typical generative model in NLP is an LSTM language model. So here is a small quiz. Uh, which of the following models are discriminative or uh, generative? So the standard uh, by LSTM uh, POS Tiger, uh, so it is um, discriminative because it predicts the post text uh, given the input uh, sentence. Uh, so the globally normalized uh, PO, CRF uh, POS Tiger, it's also discriminative uh, because it's also a conditional, uh, uh, it auto models a conditional distribution of P, uh, tax, uh, POS text given the input sentence. And the language model, as I just mentioned, this is a, a generative model. So let's first look at several types of variables. So first, the observed variables versus the latent variables. So observed variables are variables that we observe at learning time. Uh, and latent variables are variables that we assume exist, but their values are not observed at learning time. And we also have deterministic variables versus random variables. So deterministic variables have a fixed value. They can be computed by some deterministic function. So for example, the output of, of a convolutional neural network is a, is a deterministic variable. And the random variables follow some probability distribution. They can take different values at a different time because they are stochastic. Uh, so let's do a quiz on the type of uh, variables. So in an attentional sequence-to-sequence -sequence model using uh, maximum likelihood estimation, so the, the so-called teacher forcing, we, are the following variables observed or latent, uh, deterministic or random? So first, the input word ID is F. So it's observed and uh, deterministic because they are given uh, before training. And the second, the encoder had a state's H. So it is uh, observed. So it's, it is latent because we don't observe them. And uh, this is deterministic because they can, they can be computed with the neural network. And uh, third, the attention value. So they are latent and deterministic. So the last one, uh, the, the output word IDs. 
So this, this one is a little bit trickier because during training, we observe them and they are deterministic. But at decoding time, uh, they are not observed. We need to predict them, so they are latent. And we usually sample, we need to sample them, sample them from the model distribution, like the softmax uh, probability distribution. So they are random. So uh, what is latent variable models? So formally, a latent variable model is a probability distribution over two sets of variables, x and z. Uh, so where x are variables that are observed at learning time in a data set, and they are latent variables. Um, so this latent variable uh, model can be parameterized by theta here. Um, the model, the latent variable model can be directed or undirected if represented with a probabilistic graph. So an older class of latent variable models uh, inject structures in the latent variables to learn interpretable structures. So for example, the topic models can learn semantic topics in an unsupervised way. So in your first assignment, you implemented a CNN classifier to predict the topic of each sentence. So and the topic labels are given in the training data uh, for, uh, for supervised learning. So however, in, super, in topic models, the topics are invisible. It defines latent topic random variables and learn it in a fully unsupervised manner. Another uh, typical example is the hidden Markov models. Uh, it's very so we we had a question. Um, uh, I think it might have come to me privately instead of to the class, but um, it was uh, didn't understand how the output IDs are random and not deterministic uh, because the softmax always gives the same result. Oh, okay. Uh, so I I also thought about this problem uh, when I give the lecture. Uh, so because we have different decoding algorithm, for example, the beam search decoding, uh, for example, the gradient decoding, and uh, we sometimes also sample, uh, we sometimes uh, sample from the uh, softmax distribution. Because the output tokens, they follow the distribution output, uh, that is uh, the output of our model. So they are computed from the softmax function uh, so they follow this categorical distribution. So they are random variables, uh, they are statistic. But if you use the gradient decoding and all the beam search decoding, um, because this, this decoding mass methods are heuristic, they always take the argmax uh, prop, uh, token from the uh, softmax probability. So at this time, this can be, uh, this is deterministic. Is this clear? Yeah, and, and uh, I think this is a, a very good explanation. Um, I, I would also note that in general, when we have a, a um, variable that has a probabilistic interpretation in some way, and otherwise, in other words, we could sample from it theoretically. Mm -hmm. uh, that's often uh, that's often considered a random variable, even if we don't actually do so. Yes. Um, so, you know, when we're calculating a softmax, a softmax calculates a probability distribution. So we could theoretically sample uh, from that variable. Um, so I, I think that might be the distinction. Yeah, so I, I got another question. So, uh, so Manik asked, how is encoder Hannestan's state latent uh, since it can be computed using a deterministic function from an observed variable x? Uh, so by latent, we mean uh, the, ob the, ob the variable is not observed before training. So before training, you don't know uh, the value of the, uh, the hidden state. So this is latent. You didn't observe the value of that, that variable. So is this clear? Okay, uh, so I will continue. Uh, yeah, so hidden Markov model is very popular uh, in, in classic machine learning field, and it can be used as an unsupervised tiger for part of speech tagging or speech recognition. Uh, there are also tree-structured model, latent variable models that can be used for unsupervised parsing. So these topics are relatively old methods in the classic machine learning field. 
However, these traditional methods have also been combined with deep learning models to scale better on more complex and uh, a more complex scenario or larger data sets. Um, so why do we want to study latent warrior models? Uh, there are two main reasons. Uh, the first one is some data uh, is naturally unobserved. For example, the topics of an article, the, the expression of a human uh, face, or the cause of a clinical trial. Uh, and the second, uh, and I think it's the most important reason for studying uh, latent viral models is that they enable us to leverage our prior knowledge when defining a model. So we can inject some inductive bias of prior knowledge when specifying the structure of the latent variable models. So for example, if we know uh, there are several topics existing in a text dataset, then we can model the documents as a mixture of k distributions, one for each topic. Uh, this will be a more accurate um, uh, model. And I will try to make these concepts more clear in the rest of the lectures. Um, so in many cases, we would like to build a model that is able to understand high dimensional data with rich structures. Uh, so we, we also would like to disentangle the underlying factors that can explain the observed data. So if we have prior knowledge about real world data, we are interested in injecting our prior knowledge or inductive bias as model constraints through conditional independence properties while using deep neural networks as a powerful function uh, approximator to parameterize these conditional uh, likelihoods. So however, uh, usually human knowledge about the world is discrete. So for example, in NLP, we interpret the text with part of speech text, the dependency parse trace, et cetera. So to make the uh, learned latent variables interpretable, we often resort to latent, discrete latent variables. Mm, for example, the latent variables that have a, a categorical distribution. And we can use neural networks to model the parameters of these distributions. So this is a deep structured latent variable models. But however, note that there, uh, the, in the second point, I, I know that uh, there is always a trade-off between interpretability and uh, flexibility. Uh, because if you because if you add prior knowledge as a structure constraints in your in constraints in your model, you are, you're actually limiting uh, the capacity of your model. For example, if you just fit a, a giant neural network like a GPT-2 for language modeling, you only care about if it can fit the data distribution well, and all the latent factors are learned uh, mixed together, such as the syntax or the semantics, so they are interacting with each other. However, once we added the structure, the constraint to teach apart different factors from the model, it limits the capacity. Uh, so sometimes it can hurt the flexibility. And there are also other issues with respect to optimization through discrete latent variables that we will cover later. Um, in, so in this lecture, we will focus on deep latent variable models that can bridge the uh, uh, probabilistic graphical models and deep neural networks. So there are more than three um, categories of latent variable models in the field of deep learning. The first one is variational autoencoders that, uh, that we will focus on today. Uh, and the second one is get a generative adversarial network. And uh, you just learned it in the last lecture. And the third one is a flow-based generative model. It also becomes very popular in, in current deep learning research. Uh, so flow-based generative models learns a bijection mapping between a simple prior distribution and the complex data distribution. Um, but we are not going to cover this topic today. So today we will focus on variational autoencoders, so one of the most popular deep generative models uh, in machine learning community. Um, so the model of VAE is very simple. So we have observed data X, and we have a latent variable V that is generated from a standard Gaussian distribution. And we also have um, a function f parameterized by theta that maps v to x. So in VAE, we use neural networks to learn this mapping. Uh, so here is a real example. 
the left figure shows that each point in the latent space follows a standard Gaussian distribution. And the right-hand uh, side figure shows that the real data distribution uh, that looks like a ring. Uh, in practice, the data distribution can be uh, more complex. For example, the natural images or the text um, or, or languages. So the goal of VAE is to learn a function f parameterized by neural networks that can map uh, the latent variable z from a standard Gaussian to the observed data distribution. But we need to keep in mind that this is not a point-to-point -point mapping. This is not like mapping a point in the latent space uh, to the to, to the data space. So this is a, we need to keep in mind that this there is an underlying data distribution, and we are learning this. We are we are mapping um, to this real data distribution. Uh, I will try to make this more clear uh, later. So first, let's. Uh, think about variational autoencoder from a probabilistic perspective. Um, <clears throat> so in the probabilistic model framework, uh, VAE is a directed latent variable model. Uh, so how do we generate a, a new data point from VAE? First, we, we sample a latent variable for, for each uh, data point i. We can sample, we first sample a latent variable zi from the prior distribution defined on the latent space. Then we draw a, a data point from Px given z. This likelihood function is parameterized by theta. So we can write down the joint probability distribution over observed data x and latent variable z. So the joint probability is a product of the prior Pz and the conditional likelihood Px given z. So how do we learn the model parameters theta? Um, usually we learn models parameters by following the principle of maximum likelihood estimation, the MLE. Uh, so that, that is to say we learn a model that maximizes the, log, the marginal log likelihood of observed data to model the true data distribution. Uh, recall that when you implement an LSTM language model, you can write down the log likelihood of a sentence where the autogressive factorization and just to fit the uh, LSTL model to observe the cost of sentences. Uh, and you can use some gradient based optimization methods. But uh, if we directly use uh, MLE to learn VAE, this is very difficult. So why is this? So this is because um, there is uh, latent variables, there is random latent variables in variation autoencoder. And we needed to take integral over the latent variables z to compute the marginal likelihood of px. And you can see that this term is intractable. So imagine if, uh, if you model px given z with a complex neural network, you cannot write down the closed form expression of this uh, integral. Uh, so, so uh, so what can we do? We can also try to uh, directly maximize the marginal likelihood uh, by approximating it um, by sampling from PZ and then sum over uh, the sampled latent variables to approximate the integral. Um, but however, this is very uh, efficient. This is very inefficient because to make an accurate approximation of the integral, uh, you might need to draw thousands of samples from PZ and make one gradient update step. Uh, so how, how does VE uh, actually optimize this marginal log likelihood? So before getting into this, I will first introduce variational inference. And this is also the reason, so this is a powerful tool that VE has uh, leveraged to uh, to, to do the optimization. Uh, this is also the reason why there is a term variational in the name of uh, VAE. Uh, so variational inference is a very classic uh, classic algorithm in machine learning. Uh, so it basically cuts, cuts the inference problem into an optimization problem. And we are interested in two tasks for now. Uh, 
the first one is we want to learn the parameters of our model, uh, theta here. And the second one is that we want to uh, make inference over the with the posterior distribution, p uh, the given x. So given an input x, we would like to know its underlying factors. For example, we would like to know what topic is for an input sentence. Um, so we can compute the posterior distribution, the pro posterior probability with our model uh, by, by, ba by base theorem. Uh, so note that in the, the denominator of this uh, posterior has the form of integral over all possible configurations of the latent variable v, which is usually intractable as we just mentioned. Um, so what, uh, what variational inference does is to approximate this posterior uh, with a family of distributions, qz given x, uh, parameterized by phi. So usually uh, the, uh, the choice of this, uh, this approximation uh, posterior distribution is a distribution that is easy to, to draw samples from or is easy to evaluate. So for example, if Q is Gaussian, then uh, the phi here is its mean and variance. Um, note that the Q distribution can be any, dist any form of distributions of the. It does not, it uh, does not have to condition on X as well. I put it here in the form of Q phi the given X uh, uh, because I want to align this with the VE formula and you will, um, uh, you, it will be e easier for you to understand. So to learn this variational approximation, uh, so the Q, if to learn this uh, Q distribution, that is a pro approximation to the true posterior P, the problem becomes to minimize the KL divergence between the approximated uh, posterior uh, Q and the true posterior P. Uh, note that as we just mentioned, the true posterior is intractable to compute. Um, so, uh, so this this KL divergence is not easy to compute as well because there is a, a there is a true posterior inside it. Uh, so with some very simple algebra, uh, we can rewrite the log likelihood of uh, uh, of x as the sum of variational lower bound, so the elbow and the above um, KL divergence. So you can do this math afterwards. Uh, this is uh, you just need some very simple. Uh, algebra um, to derive this. So this this uh, elbow is called uh, evidence lower bound. Uh, it's also called uh, variational lower bound. Uh, so uh, the KL divergence, because KL divergence is always non-negative, so the uh, elbow, the evidence lower bound, is a lower bound on the log likelihood. That's why it's called evidence lower bound. So as we can see, uh, maxi, uh, to maximize uh, uh, the KL divergence is equivalent, uh, to, to minimize the KL divergence is equivalent to maximize the, uh, the elbow. Uh, and uh, this solves the problem how to learn the inference model, uh, Q5, V given X. So we just rewrite the uh, elbow in this slide again. Um, we then know that what we, we now know the learning objective is VE. It's just the one instantiation, instantiation of the variational inference algorithm. So in VE, we actually is maximizing the, the evidence lower bound on the log likelihood. Uh, if you have, uh, if you have uh, read the reading material, you should be very familiar with this formula of elbow. So the first term is uh, reconstruction loss. So it's an objective that is similar to a vanilla autoencoder. The second term is new to VE. It's the KL divergence between the Q distribution and the prior distribution of the. And the, the second term can be viewed as a regular rather the way it learns the parameters of the inference model, Q5, 
and the model parameter theta simultaneously with a gradient descent algorithms. Um, as we just uh, mentioned before, the lower bound is tight only when the uh, the the approximation q q distribution is accurate. So when the KL divergence here uh, is zero. Um, so uh, at, at, the, at this case, the uh, approximation posterior Q equals to the true posterior. And this tight, uh, this lower bound is tight. Uh, when the lower bound is tight, we are optimizing the actual marginal log likelihood of X. Um, I will I will leave the derivation of this inequality as an exercise to you uh, after class. It's not a hard. Uh, the hand is to use the Jason's inequality, or you can also derive it uh, straightforward uh, by following the KL divergence of Q and P from the previous slide. Hey, Jin Ding. Mm -hmm. I, I had a, a question about where the, um, a little bit more explanation about where the variational part comes from. Uh, so, like, w what does the term uh, variational mean here? Uh, okay, so, um, so variational inference is a is a very old topic, and uh, the the idea of variational inference is that you don't know you don't know how to compute the true posterior, and you introduce a new uh, family of distributions that is Q phi. Um, to and. The, to minimize the KL divergence between this new Q phi and the and the P theta, the, the, the true posterior, you are actually learning uh, the approximation posterior Q phi, and you want to use this as an alternative of P, P theta because when you minimize this KL divergence, um, uh, the more Q phi approaches P theta, uh, so you can you can use uh, Q phi as a surrogate for the for the true posterior. And uh, in in way E, we also introduce this. Uh, uh, so, so in variational inference, uh, many then th this KL divergence is also not possible because in KL divergence there is a there is a true posterior. So uh, what variational does is is it introduces the variational lower bound. It uh, maxima it maximizes the variational lower bound. Um, this is equivalent to minimize the KL divergence because their sum is the evidence, which is log Px. And the log, log Px is the denominator. This is a, this is a, a normali normalization term. So this is, you, you can view it as a constant when the, when the parameter, uh, given the current parameter. So their sum is, is a fixed constant. So maximize elbow is equivalent to minimize KL divergence. So this is a history of variational inference. And uh, this is where elbow comes from. Uh, and in variational autoencoder, we are uh, maximizing this elbow as well to learn this approximated uh, 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 Q distribution, the Q5 Zigen X, but not the real uh, true posterior. So that's where the variational come from. And um, uh, maybe I can also give a concrete example. So if you could go, uh, go up one slide, Chunting. So here um, we want to uh, approximate the true posterior um, with Q phi Z given X. And in the case of the, uh, the variational autoencoder, uh, in this case, the true posterior over the latent variables is actually a pretty complicated function. So mm -hmm. it, it wouldn't just be, for example, um, like a Gaussian distribution over the latent variables given x. Um, rather, it, it might be a very, you know, bumpy, non-convex distribution over, over the space. Um, but what, what we're doing is we're taking this complicated distribution and we're approximating it with something simpler. Um, for example, a neural network that takes in x and outputs z. Um, and the, the idea of variational inference is basically just, we have a complex posterior and we want to approximate it with something else. So the VAE, or exactly how we're doing the VAE here is just one example of that. 
Um, but you could come up with lots of other examples, like um, uh, you might want to approximate, you might want to assume all of the parameters in a model are uh, independent uh, it, at any certain point in time uh, was another example of a, uh, a variational approximation that people used in past, uh, past models. Um, so long story short, there's, it's a it's very wide family of techniques, um, but it all has to do with this, like approximating the true posterior with, a, with something else. Um, are, are there any, uh, does that make sense? Are there any other follow-up questions? I'm trying to think, did I get that right? Did I say? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, okay. so, so variation autoencoder is just a one instantiation of variational inference algorithm. Um, uh, yeah, I will okay. continue. So I, I, got, uh, I got thanks from the person who will you know, ask the question, so I think we're okay. Okay. Uh, uh, so, so let's uh, look closer at the variational autoencoder. Uh, as a recap, uh, the reconstruction loss uh, in VAE contains two modules. The inference network, uh, so there is a figure here. So the inference network parameterized by phi, it takes x as input and output the parameters of the posterior distribution. So it is also called encoder. Um, the second module in this reconstruction term is the generator network parameterized by phi. Uh, so it takes the latent variable z uh, as uh, uh, it takes the uh, latent variable z. Uh, sorry, sorry, it it is parameter by theta. It takes the latent variable z as input and outputs the data x. So it is also called decoder. Uh, as we just um, mentioned, so uh, before we e was invented, people have used the methods like mean field to do variational inference. Um, so it's one example of uh, what Graham just uh, gave. So like in mean, mean, in mean field, you might place straight constraints on the form of the posterior Q. Uh, for example, you can assume all of the uh, dimensions of, of Z is independent from each other. And uh, for each data point, mean field learns uh, separate parameters of Q. Uh, so there are some very rigid uh, constraints in traditional uh, learning methods. But for VAE, we can just use one neural network to model the Q distribution for all data points. So it's also called amortized variational inference. Uh, so, um, sorry. Uh, so uh, why does VAE receive so much popularity in the deep learning community? Uh, I think one of the reason, one of the reasons is because it can use neural networks as a universal function approximator to parameterize the inference model Q and the generator model P, and optimize it end to end with stochastic gradient descent in a very stable and efficient way. Uh, so therefore, we should view VAE as a new learning method for variational inference. Uh, so we can also view um, VAE as a regularized uh, autoencoder model. So without the KL divergence, uh, if we remove the prior distribution, VAE only has the reconstruction loss, which is basically an autoencoder model. And uh, from this perspective, we, can, we might understand VAE more easily. Uh, and so why do we want to have the prior distribution in VAE? Uh, why do we just uh, uh, delete the KL divergence and delete the prior distribution? Why don't we just learn, uh, uh, just to keep the encoder decoder model, learn an autoencoder? Um, because autoencoder also enables us to learn the latent representation of input X, Z. So why do we need this prior? So this is a very important question to think about. Um, and I will clarify this question by comparing variation autoencoder with autoencoder. So in, in VAE, we train the encoder and the decoder plus the uh, KL divergence term. So the KL term 
is a regular rider that can help regularize the space of the latent random variables. So after training, if we draw samples from the Q distribution, um, um, by, by sampling from the Q distribution, I mean, uh, given different data points X, we condition on them and compute uh, the Q distribution for each X, then we can draw samples from this Q distribution. Uh, we, we, will, we would expect that the drawn samples look like Gaussian because we have assumed the prior is standard Gaussian. We regularize the Q distribution with the KL divergence term to make a Q behave more like a Gaussian. Uh, so this is actually the in, uh, inductive bias we injected when learning the VE model. Because we think the latent space should look like Gaussian and we add it as a prior to regularize the posterior. Um, and recall what I mentioned in the beginning of the lecture. So one important advantage of latent variable models is that it allows to specify prior knowledge or add inductive bias in the latent space. This is one way of doing this by adding the known uh, inductive bias as the prior of latent variables and use a regularization term in the loss function. But for autoencoder, there is no regularization term to regularize the latent space. So we can still think of it after training, the learned latent representations of autoencoder forms its own uh, distribution. But what does it look like? Because during training, we didn't, uh, sorry. Because during training, we don't give any regularization to this on this di distribution. So it can look like any weird warped space, for example, a ring. Uh, so now I have a quiz for you. Uh, do you think autoencoder is a generative model or, or is a discriminative model? Um, so uh, it is a, a discriminative model. It's, it's not generative model because first, you cannot sample from it. You can never sample new data points from autoencoder. You don't know what the distribution of PZ is for autoencoder. Um, but for AE, uh, Z follows the Gaussian distribution. And we just uh, introduced it uh, in the beginning. You can, you can first sample a, a latent variable Z from, this, uh, from a normal Gaussian and then sample X of from PZ given I, PX given Z. But how, for autoencoder, you can only do reconstruction, but never sample a new data point from it. And the second reason is that if you are asked to compute the log likelihood of a new data point, you have no way to compute it with the autoencoder. But for variation autoencoder, you can compute, you can output the lower bound of log likelihood of a new data point X. So to summarize, the advantage of uh, variational autoencoder includes, uh, first we can learn a generative model with VAE and sample new data points from it. Also given a data point, we, com we can compute uh, the lower bound of its log likelihood to do a density estimation. Second, we can use VAE to learn meaningful representations, uh, latent representations. And this latent space can be regularized by the prior distribution. It provides a flexible way to inject inductive bias to the model by specifying the prior. Uh, third, learning VAE is fully unsupervised. We don't need any labels. We can learn VAE with, uh, with raw input, attack, input data, and uh, we can use it for unsupervised uh, latent structure learning. So this is a um, table uh, that summarizes what I just uh, 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 talk, talked about. Uh, so VAE can do generative modeling, representation learning, unsupervised learning, and the control, and we can control the representation space um, by the prior. But for autoencoder, uh, it's not generative modeling. It can do representation learning. Uh, it's, it's unsupervised learning, but we cannot control the latent space. Uh, so for, for LSTM language model, uh, so what are the properties of this model? Um, 
so this is a quiz, but I just give you the answer. Um, so it's a generative model, and uh, we can do representation learning, and it's unsupervised, um, but we cannot control the uh, the latent rep uh, representations. Um, and for the CN classifier, you just implement it in assignment one. Uh, it's discriminative model. Uh, you can learn representations. It's not unsupervised. You need the labels, and we cannot control the uh, representation space. Uh, so next, we will take a further look at how the parameters of VE is optimized. So the parameters of VE includes uh, phi and theta. Theta is the parameters for the inference network, and the theta is the parameter for the generator network. Uh, note that in the reconstruction term, uh, there is an expectation over the posterior Q. Since we cannot write down the closed form of this expectation, so we can only draw samples to approximate this expectation. But uh, sampling breaks the gradient backpropagation. We cannot backpropagate gradients through samples. I think Graham has uh, mentioned this before in the re re uh, reinforcement learning uh, lecture. So VAE proposes a very clever trick for gradient estimation called reparameterization trick. If you have read the grading material, you probably have been familiar with it. So the trick expresses the sampling uh, from the Q distribution as a two-step procedure. First, uh, we sample noise epsilon from the normal Gaussian, uh, which is indicated by the red block in the figure. Second, we use the encoder to compute the mean and variance of the posterior Q, and we, uh, we product the noise with, its with, the noise with the variance and add the mean vector. So we, we get a new latent vector, and uh, we can fit this new latent vector to the de decoder. So from this computation graph, you can see that the gradients can flow back to the encoder. Uh, and this creates a low variance gradient estimator with stochastic samples. Um, so to, to summarize, this sample trick uses another source of samples and use a function to convert it to the distribution of interest. So note that not all the, prob the probability distributions can be applied with this trick. There are few categories of distributions that we can apply uh, this reparameterization trick. So Gaussian, vari Gaussian random variables provide the simplest example. Uh, I will introduce an example of applying VAE to language modeling. Uh, this is also the first paper uh, that applied VAE for NLP tasks. Um, so this paper uh, so re re recall that when we generate a sentence from an autoregressive uh, language model, such as uh, the LSTM language model, we start with a, we start with a start of sentence symbol and a condition on the previously generated tokens to generate the next token, and until we generate uh, uh, the end of sentence token. Um, but in, in variational uh, autoencoder language modeling, it learns, it learns an uh, encoder-decoder with latent space following the normal uh, Gaussian distribution. Um, and you can think it as each, each, each sentence corresponds to a latent variable in the Gaussian space. And that's why this paper is called generating sentence from a continuous uh, space. So here are some examples. Uh, see, here are some generated sentences from the standard encoder-decoder model and the uh, VAE language model. So the bold sentences, uh, the first and the last sentences in each block are sentences from, the, from a data set. In the experiment, uh, first the latent vectors are computed uh, for each of the bold sentences. And, uh, uh, and then in the experiment, it does a, uh, it computes the linear uh, interpolation of these two latent vectors. So the linear interpolation is taking a point on the line of the two vectors. So you can get 
many other latent vectors between these two latent vectors. And uh, you can decode the new sentences with the uh, inter interpolated uh, latent vectors. Um, and, uh, and we can also do the same thing to the standard autoencoder. And as you can see that uh, the generated sentences from the intermediate, intermediate random variables for standard autoencoder, the generated sentences are not fluent. They are not uh, grammatically correct. Um, but for VAE, uh, you can see that there is a smooth transition from uh, the first sentence to the last one. And they are uh, gram uh, grammatically correct. And you can also, uh, you can also observe a, a smooth tra transition in the syntactic similarity from one end to the other. And, and uh, uh, do you know why uh, this happens? Um, so why there is a dif uh, different uh, observation from standard encoder decoder and the way E? So this is because we have placed a prior distribution, the normal Gaussian, in the regular regression term. We use this uh, in the KL divergence to regularize the posterior. And during training, this regular rather keeps the latent vectors of each input sufficiently diverse. diverse. So it learns a smooth latent space. And the, Gaussian, and the Gaussian space is a convex set. And that's why when you do linear interpolation, uh, when you sample other random variables from it, the decoder can still generate valid sentences. On the other hand, there is no regular rather in standard autoencoders. The learned latent, latent space can be very warped and secured. It cannot guarantee that when you do linear interpolation between two points in the latent space, the new latent uh, vector still falls inside this latent space. Yeah, is that clear? Uh, any questions so far? Uh, okay. Uh, so there is an example on, uh, on GitHub um, for variational autoencoder of uh, language modeling. You can try it out. Uh, next, I will talk about the difficulties of training VAE. So there is a notorious a problem when training uh, variational autoencoder models called posterior clefts. So this refers to a phenomenon when, uh, when the decoder of VAE ignores the latent variable V, but only rely on the decoder itself to generate the outputs. So at this time, the generator Px given V collapses into Px. And at the same time, you will observe that the KL divergence is very small, meaning that uh, the posterior distribution QZ given X is almost identical to the prior distribution PZ, which is just a standard Gaussian. So uh, all of these observations mean that uh, the learned uh, latent vectors Z is independent from uh, the input X. Thus the model is collapsed. Um, and could not learn any informative latent representations of the. So this is an active uh, research area uh, in, uh, in machine learning. So there are many interpretations proposed to explain why posterior collapse happens. So one simple explanation is that uh, the reconstruction loss requires to learn a good generative model, while the KL divergence is much more easier to learn. Thus, the model can just simply set the Q distribution to the prior distribution and ignores it in the decoder. And uh, there are many approaches proposed to alleviate this problem. I will introduce several uh, popular and simple methods in this line of research. Uh, the first one is we can anneal the loss of KL divergence by mul multiplying a width lambda that starts, that starts at zero and uh, gradually uh, increases to one. The idea is very straightforward. Um, so the model is allowed to, to focus on using Z for generation at the early stage of training before getting penalized by the KL loss. And uh, the second solution is also uh, very simple. 
it, this is called the free beats or KL thresholding. So free beats replaces the KL term in the elbow with a hinge loss that maxes each component of the original KL with a constant. So lambda here is called um, target rate. So the i is the s dimension in the latent variable the. So with free beats, with free beats as a uh, objective, it gives up on uh, minimizing the KL divergence for some dimensions of Z that are already below a threshold. So if the KL divergence is uh, smaller enough, we don't optimize it anymore. Uh, the second solution uh, is weakening the decoder. Um, this, is, uh, this is paused because um, people observe that when VE is equipped with a, a powerful decoder, uh, the posterior collapse problem is more likely to happen. Um, so the decoder, the powerful decoder in deep learning uh, includes autoregressive decoders such as LSTM or transformer. So these decoders can rely on its own history to, product, to predict the next token or, pix or pixel and can ignore the conditional latent variables. Oh, I got a question. Uh, I don't quite, how can the decoder ignore the latent variable is, if the latent variable is its input? Uh, so for example, if, uh, so if you just learn a posterior rear that always outputs the zero vector, and this zero vector is not associated with the input vector, it's independent from the input xz, uh, it's not useful for the decoder, so the decoder do not use it. It just relies on its own history to to um, to um, minimize the loss function. Um, is this clear? And, and to give a, a more concrete example, um, if you have a weight matrix that is multiplied by the latent variable as part of input into the neural network, uh, what the decoder could do is it could learn to just set all of the values of that weight matrix to be zero and then the latent variable will have absolutely no effect on the decoder whatsoever. So uh, that, that would be an, a concrete example of exactly how it could learn to ignore things. Yeah, yeah, because, uh, because the prior is a standard Gaussian. So standard Gaussian has a zero mean. So if, if when the decoder ignores the, the latent vector Z, uh, and the KL divergence is very small, so basically, uh, the model just assigns the Q distribution to the standard Gaussian, which basically it outputs the zero vectors. Um, so, uh, so this is more like, a, the, this problem is more prominent when you equip your VE with a powerful decoder. Uh, so it's also mentioned, it's also been proven theoretically in Chen et al's paper that the optimal st uh, strategy for the decoder is to just ignore Z when it is not necessary to use it. And the, a straightforward solution to this is to weaken the decoder uh, such, such that the decoder cannot fit, uh, uh, cannot generate the data, cannot generate the data well on its own and force it to use the latent variable Z. Uh, so methods in NLP include use a word dropout to occasionally skip inputting uh, the input the input previous words in in X, um, or use a convolutional decoder with limited context. So the last solution I will present today is from Jun Xianhe here at CMU. Uh, his paper also provides an elegant explanation of why posterior collapse happens in VE. Uh, so for short, it is because the inference network Q fails to catch up with the model's true posterior at the initial stage of training. So he proposes a, a simple solution to this by converting the optimization on theta and phi into a max-max optimization problem. So the inference network uh, phi will be uh, aggra aggressively updated before performing each update on the model parameter theta. Okay. Uh, okay, next I will cover how to handle discrete latent variables 
uh, in this section because I just mentioned uh, this create latent variables is very uh, useful and uh, it's interpretable in many cases um, and uh, we would like to use them. Um, okay, so so in many cases we um, we often interpret uh, the observed data with discrete variables. For example, the part of the part the part of speech text of of word, uh, the class of a question, the writer traits, uh, whether left-handed or right-handed, or the writing style, whether formal or informal. However, it's not easy to handle the optimization with respect to uh, discrete latent variables, and I will introduce several methods next. Uh, the most straightforward one is enumeration. Um, sorry. So when, oh, oops. So when the number of possible configurations for the is small, we can just sum over all of them and compute the exact marginal log likelihood. For example, if they follow the categorical distribution and only have five classes, for example, in, your, in like a sentiment classification problem, you might only have five classes, five classes of the sentiments. You can do the exact, uh, you can you can compute the exact marginal log likelihood in this case. However, when the number of configurations of they is very large, for example, the vocabulary the vocabulary size of text generation can be tens of thousands. The other case is structured prediction problem where we might have exponential, uh, large, exponentially large search space. We cannot enumerate all possible configurations under these circumstances. Otherwise, it is too costly. So Sorry, we, um, Chinting, we have a question about what is the effectiveness of option four with respect to the other options for handling posterior collapse? Does it solve the problem since it does not require? Okay, uh, so remember when we want to, uh, when we want to solve the problem of posterior collapse, we, we actually don't want to weaken the decoder because the better the decoder is, uh, the the better quality of generation we can get. So we don't want to awaken the decoder. And we want to solve this problem by maybe digging into uh, why this happens. So the solution for here uh, in Junxian's paper, um, he, uh, he first explains why a posterior class happens from the perspective of the, infer the, the lagging inference network. Uh, because the, the inference network cannot catch up with the true model post posterior. And, the, and the, uh, minimizing the KL divergence between Q and the true posterior is our ultimate goal of, of optimizing elbow. So Junxian what Junxian proposes is to aggressively update the uh, posterior uh, to catch up with the true posterior before making an update on the decoder. Uh, and the, the, the other uh, solutions, like solution one and the solution two, uh, so I think this is somehow parallel as well. This is orthogonal. You can also like add the KL, uh, add KL divergence annealing or the KL stress holding um, by combining with this uh, uh, solution four. And, uh, and note that uh, but Junxian also compares his method to the pre previous proposed method, and he he saw some significant improvement with this method alone. And uh, also, it had a, um, a kind of a high level uh, overview. So, solution one is temporarily mod modifying the training objective. So, it, it's not if you anneal the KL term so that it become eventually becomes one, then you're training with the real uh, training objective at the end. But at the very beginning of training, you're training with a different training objective. Uh, solution number two, um, if you keep these free bits for the, um, for the entirety of training, then this is actually just a, a different training objective. It's not the, you know, it's not the actual uh, VAE training objective. Um, 
So, and then for number three, obviously you have to change the model. So number four is the only solution that is basically keeping the standard training objective for the entire training process and not, you know, modifying the model, not modifying the training objective or anything like that. So that is, um, uh, that's a difference. And I think theoretically, you know, it, it's kind of a nice thing. You're not actually changing, um, uh, changing yeah, things. Trying to, yeah. So yeah. we have another question. Uh, so the other question is, are we effectively breaking the training and updates into two separate steps? Uh, that is right. So for Junxian's paper, at the initial training stage, uh, it has uh, two separate update steps. So first you aggressively optimize phi, and then uh, you fix phi, and uh, only optimize uh, theta for one update. Uh, but uh, he, has a, uh, he has a threshold to stop this aggressive training procedure, which is uh, approximated uh, mutual information between X and Z. So when, when, this, uh, when this value achieves some threshold, he will uh, recover back to the normal training of VE. Um, yeah, is this clear? Okay, uh, and I also want to know that if you are familiar with expectation maximization algorithm, you will see that uh, the solution four is very similar uh, to, to that in the spirit. Because in expectation maximization, in the E step, uh, you first use the true model pos posterior to, uh, to tight the lower, uh, evidence lower bound. And then in the maximization step, you are maximizing the model parameter theta. So in the, in the spirit, they are very similar. Okay. Um, uh, okay, so uh, sampling. Uh, where? Um, so, oh, when we have a very large uh, number of configurations of the latent variable Z, we cannot enumerate uh, all of them to to compute the exact marginal log likelihood. Uh, so what we can do is to sample a subset of configurations of the. Recall that in VE we need to take expectations over the latent variable Z, um, and the discrete samples will break the back propagation of gradients through samples. So in this case, we can use a score function gradient estimator introduced uh, in previous reinforcement learning class uh, where they use the log derivative trick. But note that this gradient estimator is unbiased but has a very high variance. So we have to introduce methods in the previous class on how to control the variate. For example, we can manage a baseline score. Um, so under this method, recall we also have introduced uh, minimal, minimum risk training with respect to the model samples. So I hope you can have a good review uh, of our previous class uh, afterwards. So the third method is, is reparameterization trick uh, applied to discrete latent variables. Um, recall that the reparameterization trick we use, this, uh, we, we use a different distribution to sample noise and use a parameterized function to convert the noise back to our desired distribution. And remember, we have, uh, we have given an example of the reparameterization trick in the case of a Gaussian random variable. In that case, we sample noise from a standard uh, Gaussian distribution. So this trick has also been invented to apply on discrete random variables. So the original distribution we want to take expectation over is a categorical distribution, P. The trick introduces another noise distribution, which is called a Gumbel uh, distribution. And we sample noise from this Gumbel distribution with parameter zero and one. Then the samples from the original categorical distribution can be recovered by taking argmax of the original uh, categorical probability plus the noise. And this follows a Gumbel max trick. So we can, get, we can recover the, uh, the original samples from the categorical distribution, which is they had here. But however, up till now, 
the backpropagation is still impossible because this uh, function we use to convert back uh, is a, is the argmax operator, which is not differentiable. So one simple way to solve this is we can soften the decision and allow for continuous gradients. So uh, one, so so we can we can simply use a soft max function with temperature tau instead of the argmax um, to to replace the argmax operator. So note that uh, as tau uh, approaches to zero, it's more like the argmax where we can take the true samples. Uh, so from the soft max distribution, we can back back propagate through the uh, we can back propagate the gradients. Uh, so that's why this method is called Gamba Softmax. Uh, so last, I will introduce several applications of VAE in the NLP community. Uh, so this paper is from Miao and Blossom for text summarization uh, called Language as a Latent Variable. It introduces a sequence of discrete latent variables to represent the compression of the original input. So the prior distribution is a distribution defined by a pre-trained language model. And this is why the title of this paper comes from uh, um, latent variable model as a as random variable, uh, latent variable uh, model as a language. It uses semi-supervised learning to simultaneously learn the encoder. Um, so the second work is our work on labeled shit sequence transduction, where the decoder is, con is controlled to generate output specified by target labels. We employ both discrete and the continuous variables and apply the model to morphological reinflection. The discrete latent variables represent the target labels, for example, uh, uh, whether a word is a uh, plural or singular, whether it, whether it's a noun or verb, or verb, and uh, well, the continuous variable represents the lemma of the input. Uh, so, struct VAE is a work from your TA Peng Cheng. Um, uh, it proposes a semi-supervised uh, approach for semantic parsing, uh, where the discrete latent variables are employed to represent the latent semantic tree structure. So similar to the first paper we just discussed, the prior distribution is a pre-trained language model um, that is trained on the linearized semantic path trace. So it can represent uh, the, so the latent variable models are, are used to represent the latent trace structure. The last word I want to introduce is uh, unsupervised recurrent neural network grammar. Um, by Yun Kim. Um, so this work is for unsupervised grammar induction without supervision. Um, it uses a flexible generative model called recurrent neural network grammar for good language modeling performance. It also uses a structured inference network, CRF parser, to regularize the posterior that can learn a linguistically meaningful tree structure. So this is a, a very typical example of injecting inductive bias in the learning of latent variable models. Mm, okay, uh, that's all for today's lecture. Uh, I'm happy to take questions. So th thanks a lot, Chunting. Are, are there any questions from the audience? We'd be happy to answer them. Um, so Gumball zero one distribution. Uh, actually, I don't know how it looks like. Maybe you can just uh, Google it, and I think it, it will show you a figure. Uh, you can. I think on Wikipedia there should be. And how? How does it help? Yeah. Sorry, go. Ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah. So. If you understand how reparameterization trick works, you will understand um, why Gumball soft, softmax can help us to sample from a discrete uh, um, a distribution. So the reparameterization trick is you use another distribution to sample noise. 
For example, in the Gaussian random variable, uh, we just uh, this is a very simple example where you sample the noise from a standard Gaussian, which is another source of distribution, and uh, you take samples from that distribution, and then you use a function, uh, a parameterized function, to convert the the noise back to the real samples you the true samples uh, you are interested in. For example, in in, in the, our previous example, you take samples, you take noise from the uh, zero one standard Gaussian, and then you convert back to the uh, posterior, the inference, the, the posterior distribution that your, your model is interested in. And here, for the discrete latent variables, you want, you, you, uh, so it has a uh, called the so called Gumball Max trick. So you can use this trick to convert back the Gumball noise back to the real uh, uh, distribution you are interested in, the desired distribution, the categorical distribution, by taking argmax over the log uh, probability of, of your desired distribution plus the, the noise. But the argmax here is also uh, non-differentiable. So uh, the Gumball softmax trick is to replace this argmax with uh, softmax. Uh, plus a temperature with a temperature. So when the temperature approaches zero, uh, the softmax will behave like argmax, and the, and you are and in this case you are taking the true samples from the categorical distribution. Uh, so I got a, another question. I wonder in the RSTM generation, do all the steps take the same latent variables? Uh, yeah. So there are many different ways that you can parameterize. You can uh, use the condition of Z to fit it to the decoder. For example, maybe you can just use the Z to initialize the uh, the first the uh, the first hidden state of the decoder, and you can also fit the latent variable to every step of the uh, decoder. Uh, so there are many different uh, parameterizations. Um, it's 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 not a fixed. And there are also like a recurrent latent variable models where uh, the latent variable model is parameterized by a recurrent neural network. In that case, uh, at each time step, the latent variable uh, will, uh, the behavior of the latent variable will depend on its, its own uh, history. So in that case, it in, uh, introduces small flexibility of the, uh, of the uh, posterior distribution. Yeah, is that clear? Great, Th thanks. These are good questions. Are, are there any others? Okay, um, it looks like those are all the, the questions that I have uh, at the moment. So uh, thanks a lot, uh, Chunting, and I, I think we can uh, finish up the class for today. So I'll okay. see everybody on Thursday then. Okay, thank you. Bye.